Let's get started. Um, welcome everybody. We always start with the mission statement. The Oakland Code Enforcement Project works to improve the quality of life in Oakland by bringing people and institutions together to identify code violations, advocate for their remediation, and monitor the outcomes. By way of introductions, we're just going to ask you to um, put it in the chat who you are affiliated with. And of course, when you um, speak, you know, tell if you're one of the speakers, tell who you are um, affiliated with. So I'm Elena Zaitz off the chair. Um, we are very pleased tonight to have featured speakers, Kenyon Bonner, Vice, Pro Vice Provost and Dean of Students at the University of Pittsburgh, and Paul Supowitz from the University of Pittsburgh, Vice Chancellor for Community and Government Relations. Welcome, both of you. Take it away. Thank you, Elena. Um, maybe I'll, uh, I'll, I'll introduce us and then maybe pass things off to Kenyon, but, um, you know, uh, want to kind of maybe just make some introductory comments and, and give kind of a, an overview and then um, leave plenty of time for discussion and questions. Um, so, uh, but thank you uh, very much for having us uh, uh, this evening. Um, yeah, obviously to talk about uh, something that's really dominating all of our thoughts and lives these days. Um, you know, really to, uh, up until the last couple of weeks, we really had uh, really done an amazing job, I think, with uh, keeping the virus at bay in the university community, and uh, especially compared to, to other uh, institutions, and, and even at times as compared to the region around us. But um, you know, it has been a, I will tell you, I think a, a massive all hands on deck kind of effort at the university to, uh, to, to respond and, and deal with, with the pandemic and uh, address all of the issues that it has created. Um, but uh, folks around, uh, around the university, um, uh, uh, principally our students, but also our staff and faculty have, have worked, uh, I would say, consistently and diligently. And so we want to describe uh, some of those efforts to you just very generally and then um, uh, talk briefly about kind of uh, where things are, are heading. Obviously, it's a tremendously dynamic situation as evidenced by the fact that uh, you know, just in just today and yesterday, we've had a significant number of developments in terms of changes in the guidance that's coming out of the state and and the county. Uh, if in, in case you hadn't seen the news in the last three hours, that you know the county has issued a um, you know a, a stay at home uh, mm -hmm. advisory, and uh, so uh, obviously just underscores what a what a dynamic situation it is, and also obviously it it, it underscores. Uh, you know the, the 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 resurgence in the that we've seen in the last uh, last couple of weeks, but um, you know the so you know the the we we we've, we've taken as I said a number of efforts to address it and want to kind of maybe I'll, I'll pass off to to Kenyon to really talk about some of the things and, and the efforts that we've done uh, both in in the neighborhood around the Oakland campus, but also keep in mind we have. Five other camp, four other campuses where where we've also uh, had to work uh, work in the same kind of way. But uh, you know whether it's been you know neighborhood safety walks, the work of uh, the compliance COVID uh, uh, compliance and response team that Kenyon has led, um, the off campus safety ambassadors program that's been implemented. Um, we've worked through the student conduct process. Uh, we've worked hard on on communications and messaging efforts in a variety of ways and really tried to have uh, a really robust um, uh, and transparent uh, information sources for, uh, for everyone, the university community and the larger community. And, um, and so I think uh, with that, maybe I'll, uh, if it's okay, Kenyon, hand off to you to, to maybe elaborate on a few of those things and then we can, um, can take questions. Yep. Thank you, Paul. Good, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for the invitation. I look forward to, to talking to folks tonight. Um, as, as Paul mentioned, um, you know, we began this uh, academic year with a lot of uncertainty. I think that's true with everyone in terms of how to manage um, within the pandemic environment. Um, but, I, but I do feel like, um, you know, working together, we were very successful. Obviously, there's lots of unknowns still ahead of us and room for improvement. 
but but we started the year um, with the commitment to our responsibility for the safety of our students, our faculty, our staff. And we made it very clear that we were also committed to the safety of our surrounding communities, um, being a, a good neighbor in, in, in Oakland and so um, and, and elsewhere. And so that, that was one of the basic sort of tenets of our approach this year. Um, you know, Paul mentioned a number of um, strategies that we use this year. I, I just want to start out by saying that the, the foundation of what we are doing on the campus is to try to establish a culture. And that culture is the culture of um, really pulling together as a community and supporting each other and doing what's right to protect ourselves and our, our neighbors, our colleagues, students who live on campus, students who live off campus, and um, the longtime residents of Oakland. So that culture is really important to, to what we're trying to establish. And I would say generally our students have responded well to that. Um, and I think the university environment was a, a good place to, 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 for that to, to take root. Uh, just a few examples, a little bit more detail. So one of, the, um, one of the innovative things we did in a pandemic environment is we created uh, neighborhood safety walks. Um, <clears throat> and this came out of discussions of the compliance team that I'll talk about in a second. Um, but the neighborhood safety walks was really a way for us to see what's happening in our neighborhoods at times when we're normally not in Oakland. So um, um, we, we have conducted these safety walks, um, maybe 10 plus of them for um, the fall semester on Friday or Saturday nights. And they're typically from like 10 o'clock until midnight or a little bit after. So it was an opportunity for us to meet our students where they are at times when they probably don't expect us. Um, and, and so me and Paul and Alex on some occasions and some other folks and students uh, would, would join together um, and walk through Oakland. Um, we would talk to students, engage with them in a more engaging and educational way, which was really helpful um, just to meet and let them know that we were visible. Um, we also ran into uh, neighborhood residents during some of these. I think mostly when we were walking through during the daytime hours, we were able to talk to a lot of, of neighbors who were not students. And we were trying to demonstrate positive behavior, you know, mask wearing, social distancing. Um, so our approach was really to engage. The feedback from students was um, really great. I mean, many students commented that they really felt like we cared enough to be in the community um, where they are. Uh, and we handed out a lot of masks during this process um, and handed out a lot of other materials and some really cool pit, pit stuff. Um, to just encourage the students and keep their spirits up and encourage them to follow our health and safety guidelines. I think that went well um, for the fall semester um, and um, I, I surely enjoyed it and I think our students got a lot of, out of it and I think it was really productive in terms of letting our students know that we cared enough to be in the community with them. Um, <clears throat> early in the, in the year, we created a compliance team. So we established all of these health and safety guidelines for the campus and uh, it wasn't just establishing them and then walking away. We wanted to make sure that we checked in regularly to make sure that students were complying with our health and safety standards and guidelines. And so at the beginning of the semester, pretty much most of the semester, we met every day. Uh, every day meaning every day, seven days a week, even including the weekends. And that was a team of people from student affairs, residence life, community and governmental relations, our public safety office, our student conduct office, uh, and, and someone from our COVID Concern Connection Office. And we talk about and discuss um, the issues that we were seeing coming in from off campus and on campus. A lot of that information came through our COVID Concern Connection where people were reporting uh, concerns or questions um, about um, health and safety. Um, it was a great opportunity for us to foreshadow some things uh, that were ahead of us um, and problem solve and troubleshoot when issues came, came um, to us. And so we continue to meet now um, three days a week and one day on the weekend, um, um, but we will definitely start up again um, regularly meeting uh, when the students return in the spring or most of them return in the spring. Um, the nature of the concerns from the community vary. Um, we get complaints or reports about large parties, large gatherings, um, and you know, all the way down to students asking questions about where to get information about testing and supplies and masks and things of that nature. Um, sometimes we get repeat reports for, for a specific address um, on or off campus or location on campus. Um, sometimes we don't get enough information that we can take action on. Um, some of the reports, most of them are coming in with anonymous reporters 
Um, but we do we do look at every report that comes in and there is um, appropriate follow through on the ones where we have information where we can follow up. Uh, some of these reports have led to um, conduct cases and referrals to our student code of conduct. And I'll talk about that in, in a little bit more later on. Um, but, but every report that comes in that we can take action on, we take action on whether it's formal or informal. And that has proven to be uh, fairly effective. Um, Off-campus student safety ambassadors was an idea um, we had at the beginning of the year and thinking about how we could engage students who already live off campus uh, in helping us monitor, um, helping us sort of um, convey information, uh, distribute information, uh, and have eyes and ears on what's happening in the communities when we were not around. And so uh, there was a team of folks, some of whom are on this call tonight from Pitt, who helped create the off-campus safety ambassadors. We hired 30 students who all live off campus in various parts of the neighborhoods. Um, and they are working with us and conduct rounds um, throughout Oakland <clears throat> um, on a regular basis, daily basis. And they've been able to make contact with a lot of students. I think over the course of the semester so far, they've engaged um, about 2,500 students themselves um, and handed out a lot of masks and information to help um, support uh, the community. Um, the conduct process is another question we get. So what do you do when a student violates their health and safety standards? Uh, we have a standard student code of conduct. Um, we added a health and safety policy this year in anticipation of um, what we were going to be managing. And um, for the most part, we have 30,000 students. Most of them are doing a good job. Um, we have identified students who have violated our student code of conduct and to, as of this afternoon, I think we've found uh, 310 or 11 students responsible for violating the student code of conduct. On the, on, the, on the Pittsburgh campus. And we will continue to, to refer students when we have enough information and they'll go through the process. Um, and if they're found responsible, then there are sanctions for those students. Um, communication was really important this year in terms of getting information out. Um, there's a balance with communication. You can over communicate. Our students told us that this summer, a lot of, we were sending mm -hmm. a lot of information quickly. And so we've adjusted over time and we're very strategic with our communication. Um, the, the main modes of communicating is via email or social media. Our COVID medical response office um, handles most of that information and is providing really good medical information for our students. Uh, I often uh, augment that communication with messages from me, my office, student affairs, um, and also mix it up with video messages throughout the semester. And students have responded well to all of that communication as we're trying to relay quickly um, how things are changing and they can change on a dime. Um, we also installed a lot of campus signage, um, um, obviously using our social media. Um, and we've also um, provided um, some signage to our Oakland businesses um, uh, and in some areas off campus uh, residents, we work with some landlords to install some signage in some of their large courtyard spaces. So that's been really helpful, that partnership. In terms of the spring, um, We'll, co we'll continue to plan. Um, the, the environment is changing drastically as right in front of us. And so it's hard to see exactly what our fall, our spring will look like and what our strategy will be. There are some things that we plan to repeat. There are some things that we need to modify. And there's some new ideas that we'll probably have to come up with depending on what we're dealing with in the spring um, as, as new guidance comes in and new orders are coming in and the, the pandemic is changing in terms of its environment. So. We learned a lot this semester. Um, I think we were effective in many ways, but there's also a lesson learned sort of conversation that we'll all have after our students depart uh, this week. And we'll be ready for um, a new approach if needed uh, in the spring um, to address um, you know, our students, make sure that they're safe, make sure the community's safe and, and we're responsive to the concerns that are raised by our community. So I think I'll stop there. Um, but generally, that, that's been our approach this semester and I'll open up to any questions you might have or maybe, Paul, you want to, if you have anything to add. Thanks, Kenyon. Yep. Yeah, I think that was uh, terrific. Um, uh, maybe if we just want to um, go through the couple slides that we have. Um, and uh, I will do that quickly there. Thank you. Um, just kind of repeats a couple of the numbers, some of the numbers, uh, Ken, you mentioned some others, but just, uh, you know, high level overview. Um, 
of, uh, of steps uh, taken this year, just giving you a flavor. Uh, next slide. Um, and as Kenyon talked about, obviously, you know, still in process and, and adjusting to some of the changes, but we certainly expect that the spring term will also involve some of these elements that, um, that were part of the plans this semester. Um, the staggered move-ins, uh, safety walks, uh, continuing the safety ambassadors and the flex at pit uh, programming on the academic side of things and, and continuing using the operational postures uh, uh, approach that we established. Uh, then the last slide just kind of has some uh, different ways that you can make continue to mm -hmm. stay, stay plugged in. I, I'd say if you just have have one, you know, the coronavirus.pit.edu is really comprehensive. Um, uh, the pit wire is our, uh, uh, you can sign up to get the emails of, uh, of those updates. Um, those are the more general uh, pit news updates. Uh, so with that, um, yeah, I think that's really all that we ha had, had prepared and um, are uh, happy to try to take questions or uh, discussion at this point. And Liz? Okay, yeah, I have one question. When you gave the stat 310 to 311 students uh, on the on campus with regard to um, student conduct, is that on campus or on and off campus? That's, that includes on and off campus students. On and off, okay. And one thing, walking around the neighborhood and, and <laughs> unbelievable as me saying, uh, talking to students, I've been asking a lot of them, trying to gauge, you know, how many are coming back after uh, Thanksgiving. And I, I'm, I'm getting a lot of them are saying they're coming back. Do you have anything in place for students that do come back into our community after going home for Thanksgiving? When you, you mean coming back in a week or after Thanksgiving? Yes. Okay. When you say, do we have anything in place, like with respect yeah. to- Do you have any kind of like something that they can contact? You know, I know basically that everybody was supposed to stay home after Thanksgiving, but a lot of these students, they have jobs here. They, they have their apartments here, everything they yeah. want. And they don't want to spend two and a half months with mom and dad. Right. So, yeah. so they're planning on coming back. So is there going to be anything set up for them to be able to call into uh, for any kind of issues that they run into during the break time? Yeah, that's a great question. So yeah, so Liz, yeah, of course there are, most of our, virtually all of our residence hall students are going home for the, for the um, Thanksgiving break and most of them will not return. There are some students um, on campus who are staying through for finals, final exams, because our final exam week is after Thanksgiving and as well as our off-campus students. You're right that you know, students who live off campus typically go home to visit family for the holidays and then they return to what they consider their permanent residence, at least while they're a college student. Yeah. Um, specifically to answer your question, yes, the university um, is still open um, even though classes have ended. Um, and so um, we, are, we are open through, um, I think December 16th or so before the winter break, the holidays. And so our offices will be open, our counseling center, student health, um, and any other service-oriented offices. Now, we won't have like the full, you know, fledge of services available, but those basic offices, administrative offices will be open. There are certain holidays that the university closes, and then those are days, those are days where we will not have those services available. But for the most part, um, while the students depart this Friday and this weekend, the university remains open until we go on recess okay. in late December. But if you go, you're going to go on recess from the 16th of December till when in January? I think I think the university resumes um, at least offices open on the 3rd of January, if I'm not mistaken. And it would be the, the 23rd, so that Monday. For, for um, that we closed? Yeah, the 21st. Yeah, Monday the 21st, Liz, that whole week. And then the, the following week as well, uh, Friday is January 1st, we would uh, resume business on Monday the 4th. Monday the 4th. Okay, so, but, so not December the 16th or? No, no, that was a, that was an incorrect date. Yeah, it was, okay, it, Alex is right with the dates, yeah. December the 21st. Will there be any kind of backup information or anything or, you know how kids are? 
okay, it, it, if they're back here and then something happens, is there any way they can contact or should they just contact the police or what should they do? Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I, we're working on what our winter break plan will be, winter, winter recess in a pandemic environment. So we're still, that's the conversation that we'll have um, in the coming days about what that looks like. But yes, I mean, at any time, our, our students know that they can call the pit police if there's an emergency. Our counseling center has a 24 hour hotline that students can call um, and they're connected to a, a mental health professional and our student health service also has an answering service. So those so if Panther Central also is available for students. So those basic, I need information or in, in dire situations, I need, there's an emergency, our police would be the contact for them. But we were, we were, we were talking about specifically what um, will look like um, over that recess period considering that we're, we're, we're in a pandemic and we may need to provide additional support to our students. Okay, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Kenyon, I just wanna tell you, I saw some of your videos to the students. I thought they were terrific and um, perfect. You thank, know, thank you. For, for your um, target. Um, but I do have a question. Right now, one of the possible consequences for a student who has a serious, who seriously violated the COVID compact is to lose their on-campus housing. Um, does the university help them with legal alternate housing? So I think, so that, that is a potential sanction for a student. I will tell you that it is not our first option for students. Um, we know how serious it is for a student to lose their housing privileges. And so when we get to that point, it's because a student's behavior is a detriment to the community. Um, and and, and we, need to, we need to make that decision so that in the interest of the safety of the rest of the community. So that is not something that we just hand out um, regularly. Um, and you know, to, to this date, I believe only one student has faced that sanction. Um, when we when we do that, we also work with the student to make sure that um, they have the proper support. So we're not going to put a student out on the street per se. Um, and there is an appeal process. So if a student has a situation or they have a, um, a, an issue with that sanction, um, they have the right to appeal. There's a process where they could retain their housing through that appeal process. Um, and, and if we needed to provide support to that student, we would do that. Um, so that is not something that we do regularly, normally. It is a potential sanction, as you can imagine. There could be a circumstance where a student needs to um, be suspended from our housing, but it's not something that happens regularly. So are you satisfied if their support is moving in with friends? Well, I once it's- Yeah, I got, I got somewhere to go. Yeah, I'm good. I got somewhere to go. Because it's a detriment to our community as well. Well, I think I think the reality is that once once they're out of the university community, we we can't tell a student where they can't go. I mean, they're they're a citizen and have the right to live wherever. I mean, we would we would definitely, if the student is um, COVID positive, you know, that would be something that we would consider a public health issue and make sure that wherever they're going, that they're responsible and they're not infecting other students. But if a student chooses to leave housing on their own, like voluntarily or they're suspended from housing, um, they have the right to, to live wherever they choose, um, as long as the people that they're living with are okay with that and comfortable with that. So this is a rare occurrence on our campus, but, but we have no authority to tell a student that they can't live in another house or a, a residence off campus or even back at home. Can you please consider another, an alternate consequence for those very serious cases because we don't want your, you don't want them on campus. And so you're putting them into our neighborhoods. Yeah, and if we, if we put them out of our residence halls, it's because of a very serious infraction. Right. So, um, um, and, but, but it's not necessarily something that may be a detriment to, like if, if a student violates our policies multiple times, then they could, they could face suspension from our residence halls. Um, so, so I understand your concern but, but you're asking us to, to potentially step into an area that we have really no right to do. I mean, imagine if, you know, we, we can't tell a student they can't live with friends or family members. So I think, I think to your concern, be, because we're very, um, we're very, um, you know, very particular about when we issue that sanction, that's always taken into consideration. 
And if there was a reason where a student would, we believe was a threat to the community per se, um, that student would probably be disaffiliated from the university, not just housing. Housing is uh, a step before the ultimate suspension from the university community, which is a, a higher level of concern for us. So but I don't know what your solution might be to that, but um, that, that's how we handle those, those, those issues on our campus. Sure, and, and also just to add, if we did disaffiliate from the university, we'd, we'd pretty much be in the same boat. Uh, Except then at least they'd have no reason to be in Oakland, well, less, much less reason to be in Oakland. I mean, if they had a job or something, but if they're no longer going to pit, then living around here and paying higher rent is probably not on the cards. Yeah. Um, I have one more, one more question. Uh, are you saying anything to off-campus students about if they are actually going to go home before Thanksgiving and not come back until January uh, about safety uh, in their rental units? Um, any advice to them being handed out? Like, you know, leave a radio on, put the lights on timer, make sure you lock all the windows, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we have not, but but I think I think that's really helpful information that we could we could send out to our students. Um, you know, lock your doors, lock your windows. I know we do that. We've done that before. But if you think that that would be helpful over the winter break, then yeah, that is a message that we can send out to students before they depart. And it might even be a great opportunity for them to meet their neighbors, the long-term residents, and say, "Hey, listen, I'm going home now. Can you just?" If keep a vague eye on next door for us. If anything happens, here's myself. You see a moving van, it's not me. Yes, right. <laughs> or, or just the simple, no one's supposed to be going in. Yeah, you know, they can do, they don't have to knock on the door, just leave a note, Yeah, that kind of thing, so. Yeah, the stuff we we we, uh, we do, like, you know, with our neighbors, I, I think it's good advice, Yeah. yeah. Because it's going to be a longer stretch this time, and there's always an issue with empty rental units during the breaks, you know. So this is just kind of killing two birds with one stone there. Don't leave the trash cans out on the sidewalk. Can we, well, how about also considering some communication to the group of landlords to ask oh. them to, oh. to, to step up? Done. Thank you. Awesome. It is being done. Great. <laughs> Anything else for Paul or Kenyon from anybody? I think there was a um, question in the chat about the recommended sanction, or the, I'm sorry, I'm on sanctions. Uh, the recommended uh, testing before or after students come back. And so um, is that just for residence hall students or all of campus? I don't think that we, we know that yet, but um, maybe the question is geared towards if you're leaving for Thanksgiving, going state to state, and then coming back, are you required to quarantine or what's in place for, for all of that? Yeah, we're still um, sort of just discussing the new orders from the state about testing um, when students return to campus and how that applies to students leaving for Thanksgiving and returning um, next week. So I think because the orders came out yesterday, we're still trying to get some answers to that. I mean, you can imagine that we get orders yesterday while students are leaving. We, we have to sort of sift through what that really means. Is it is it for next year when they return or is it for like immediate, effective immediately? So I'm not sure I have an answer to that, the long-term question yet, um, because we're still, we're still working with um, the information we just received yesterday to, to interpret it all. I don't know if Paul wants to add to that, but I, th I think that's that's where we are right now. No, no, that's exactly right. I know the healthcare advisory group and it's looking at those, uh, you know, what's come out from the Commonwealth and um, and you know, it's a it's a pretty long set of recommendations. And and I will say I was on a call with the Department of Education and they made it clear that um, you know these are a set of guidelines that have to be adapted by each um, university to fit their circumstances. Additionally, are you taking into account the fact that like the state of New York is now putting up their own quarantine rules? California, Illinois, Indiana, it's a growing list um, of, you know, they want 14 day quarantine when they come back. And 
then we need to quarantine when they come back here. It's all this, I mean. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of, so we got some really smart and patient people kind of having to sift through all of that and figure out how it impacts our community and how we'll provide guidance to our students. Yeah, so yeah, you're, I mean, you're, I think you're identifying something that's a challenge for all of us as all of these states have their own requirements. Mm -hmm. Our students are from around the world, every state and many countries. So it's gonna be an interesting um, puzzle to put together. Yeah, it is. Well, anything else, Any anybody? Thank you so much. This was very timely and appreciated. All right, and we're gonna move on to um, public safety. Commander Herman, zone four. He was, yes, there he is. Hey, hello everybody. Thank you for joining uh, the team tonight. Um, I'm gonna let Dave Schifrin, who is right there in front of me, yep. um, do the stats here. And if uh, maybe I can elaborate on some of the stats and then uh, I'll open up the, uh, for any questions for the zone four community, okay? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, hi, uh, Officer Schifrin here. So I'll be reading the uh, numbers that compare September to mid-October and October to mid-November. Um, and they are, uh, we saw robberies go down. There were two versus one in the later month. Burglaries also down, seven down to two. Uh, theft from person went from six down to one, which is a nice jump downward. Mm -hmm. Residents from eight to four, so that dropped by half. And then uh, ones we had that uh, rose were, there was one rape, so it went from zero up to one. Um, there was one arson, again, zero to one. Stolen vehicle, again, zero to one. Uh, theft from orders went from two up to three. First from businesses went from six to seven. So that whole pattern of increases were all jumping by, by one. Uh, and that by deception went from three to five. So that went up two. Um, so altogether there were six of, that, of those numbers that went up, four went down. And uh, that's a, let's see, the numbers were the total of uh, from the first month were 36, the total from the, seven, the second month were 28. That's a decrease of uh, eight or 22%. Um, let me touch also on the arrests. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, all of them were, uh, there were only one arrest in the following, uh, to find trespass, criminal trespass, causing a risk and catastrophe, possession of controlled substance, theft from business, theft from residence, harassment, and one escape. Those are all one. Then there were two categories that uh, were somewhat more. Simple assault, there were four of those, and there were three warrants, uh, warrant arrests. So that total 15. Um, those are the numbers. Uh, I wanted just to touch on what uh, Liz was saying a moment ago also, um, which is uh, talking to students and putting out some kind of a you know, tip sheet or suggestions as for how they can uh, guard their homes while they're away from them, I think is a great idea. It's something that we touch on often in uh, the weekly snapshot. Things like, as you touched on Liz, um, <clears throat> locking doors and windows, being sure they're locked front and back doors and windows. Um, Having those automatic lights are great. And they, most of them have random settings. So if someone is watching your house at all, they notice that, they won't notice that at you know, 5.52 each night it comes on, um, but you can set it for random. And also talking with the neighbors, I think is a great idea for establishing some kind of relationship between the neighbors and the students. It's uh, a thing that I think the uh, neighbors would be happy to help out with because Student safety is their safety also. Um, so if anyone would like, uh, oh, 
I jarred the couple too also, which was uh, stopping the mail so it doesn't pile up in a mailbox. So um, if they get newspaper delivery, stopping it. Um, and we'll see what snow is like. But if there's snow on the ground, it can be great to have a neighbor um, not shovel the walkway. I mean, that would be terrific, but it's asking a lot. But instead, just to traipse up once or twice when there's snow and leave footprints to and fro. And that, uh, you know, doesn't become a, a, an invitation if there's untrodden snow uh, saying, announcing that somebody's not there. So, uh, again, anybody who'd like that. Further information, just uh, contact me or uh, I'll be glad to send you the weekly snapshot. And I think there's mention, Liz has said, of where to uh, request it. Thank you. Was that, do you know if that um, one rape is because it was recorded at McGee? Well, I can touch on the rapes. There's actually two rapes recorded. One was at uh, Three Rivers Heritage Trail, and that's across the river, but it's still in um, a census tract associated with Oakland. Mm -hmm. That it was a female said she was jogging and two people come out and uh, sexually assaulted her. But uh, we we investigated that thoroughly. The sex assault detectives investigated thoroughly. We have a few cameras over there, and we cannot say that that rape actually occurred. Um, so we're that, that's still an open case. There was another rape reported at Craft in Fifth Avenue. And that was a 39-year-old female undergoing dialysis, but she also has schizophrenia and hallucinations, and that is unfounded. So in reference to those two rapes, we don't have a rapist running around there. Um, in reference to some of the other ones, the robbery, and that's a violent crime, but that was an elderly male getting onto a bus and an elderly homeless female reaching into his pocket and stealing his money. Uh, she was arrested. Um, the two burglaries reported where one was on Oakland Avenue, the other one was on Atwood, and they were unlocked doors where someone walked in and took uh, laptops and a couple other electronic pieces there. Um, in reference to the arson, the arson uh, was uh, one of the protesters burning the flag in Shenley Park. So they sound kind of mean and uh, violent, but uh, they end up not being so violent after you look into it. So that's the explanation for that. Not too many crimes. We are uh, 36 last time we reported here, and today they're 28, so we're, we're done pretty much. Uh, any questions? Do we have any kind of update on the fire at 3401 Bates Street? Uh, we don't. We do have video recordings of two people leaving that area, and we have it in a sequence of two cameras and I can get it out there to the public, but I have to get permission first. If you know these people, they're young guys, if you, young white males, if you know them, you'll recognize them. But just trying to identify them by the videos that we have would be difficult. But if you say, oh yeah, I know that guy, that's, that's, that's John Joe from over on uh, uh, South Oakland. Um, so they did, one guy actually went uh, on Juliet toward Bates. Um, I'm sorry, one went to Juliet toward Fraser and the other one went to uh, up toward Bates after the fire. Uh, we don't know why they would set it on fire. It may, it's a very juvenile way of setting an arson. It wasn't professional at all. So it could be just a couple homeless people and decided to do a little criminal mischief and uh, the fire really didn't spread too much. It was, it was contained within the second floor hallway. It looked like they splashed some liquid on the wall, lit it up and took off. And, or was that again? It looked Open like uh, it looked like they threw some liquid onto the, the hallway wall. I'm at the address of the fire. Open Third. Gateway Ventures on Bates. Yeah, so uh, so like I said, so we do have video on that, and I may be able to get it out to the public or onto the uh, local television shows, so uh, on local uh, news uh, outlets. So we're still working on that. Um, any other questions? Okay, the incident on Hamlet Street with the gentleman that he keeps having his car attacked. Yeah, he I looked into the history with that. Um, there's from July till today or the 15th, there was um, three, four criminal mischiefs um, and one ordinance complaint, which was, I think, loud noise, loud party. 
and a property report. I wasn't able to look at all of them. Um, I, I will look at them now to see what this gentleman is up to and uh, work on it. We removed the camera from that area and we put it over by the Columbus statue to keep guard down. Once we deal with the statue, uh, which seems to be winding down now, there hasn't been any uh, um, graffiti there in a while. Um, I'll mention on putting that camera back, and if not, then I'll get another camera over there just to watch and see what's going on here. Yeah, because this gentleman's situation is not the best to begin with, and it's he's fairly isolated on that little stretch of Hamlet. So, um, so you mentioned. Um, 3213, I'm sorry, 3215 Kennett Square. Oh, yes. Oh, um, yeah. That happened on the 15th at uh, quarter to one in the morning. Our guys got a call for a loud party in the back. There was a live band with drums. Uh, the officers went over there, and uh, the, the people living there were very cordial, and he had them turn it down right away, but he noticed they youngster drinking beer in the front sidewalk and when he noticed uh, the officer he put the beer down and when the officer was asking him his name and things of that nature you know the, the young kid he was a student at Pitt he, he got he, he was drunk and he was uh, kind of out of control so he was identified he wouldn't give his name at first but he eventually was identified and he's receiving two citations one for public intox and the other for having an open container of alcohol on a city street in that same incident, somebody else came up to the officer and was um, touting the officer, challenging the officer. And that person will also receive a citation for uh, his actions there. In reference to the history of 3215 Kennett Square, we have only had two calls to that address prior to this one. One was a, a fight, which was outside. It's not associated with the home. But the fight happened there, and uh, when the officers got there, one student ran. I'm going to say a student, but one youngster ran. The other one didn't want to have anything to do with police. So that was not even a report. And the other one was a, um, a sheriff deputy serving uh, some legal paperwork to that address. I did a history check in 2018. There was two calls there. I'm sorry, uh, 2019, there were two calls there. And 2018, there were no calls there. So we're talking about three years, there was only three calls there. Now, if you look at the next door at 20, uh, 32, 13, there was a couple calls there, but uh, not much at all. So yeah, the 32, 13, I'm sorry to interrupt you, the 32, 13 landlord um, warned them. So they've moved. It's really the same people. Okay, so both of those, they're connected. It's like a duplex there. So both yeah. of those mm -hmm. properties together generated very little calls over the last three years. So um, in reference to the latest one where they were cited, I am putting that on a disruptive property list. Um, so that's, that's uh, three citations associated to that home, but it's only one incident. So any other questions? Much appreciated, Commander Herman. Actually, um, 3213, are there two apartments there? Is that right? I don't know if there's two apartments. It's a side by side with each have their own porch. It looks like two separate homes. Um, it's a one's 3213, one's 3215, you know. Yeah. Okay. Many of them are, would have to check the occupancy permit. Okay. So. Say it's complicated right now. Yeah, and um, I think you mentioned the uh, the vehicles parking the wrong way. And oh. on which street was that? Just and not anywhere in Oakland. <laughs> yeah, anywhere in Oakland, right? But we do have an officer that tackles that problem. He actually makes uh, notices out of card stock, and we put the law, the traffic code on it, and we start flipping them on people's windshields. Uh, once he comes back, and if it's not a snowy condition, I can have him come over there and blanket that whole South Oakland or wherever problem is by doing that. It's a temporary fix. Um, if we had to write citations, we'd be writing them. Uh, we'd get carpal tunnels writing them. Yeah. So uh, there's so many, just people don't understand that. But it is a danger to bike riders. It is a danger if you're pulling out and another car mm -hmm. is in the opposite way. So we do understand that, but it's it's ubiquitous throughout Oakland and the whole city. You know, Getting better for a while, but uh, especially after COVID now, it's just, you know, caution to the wind. It's just, a, it's actually, I'd say worse. 
Yeah, well, well, like I said, when the officer comes back, he was off on some uh, carpal tunnel surgery from writing too many tickets, you know, so <laughs> he got it done on both hands. He'll be back. He's going to be my new community resource officer in January. So, uh, but he helped me out doing that same thing here in Squirrel Hill. And that's what we'll do there. Uh, I think he'll be back next week. Okay. The only other thing I'm getting calls on is the people that are parking in their front yard driveway, but they're actually parking on the sidewalk. We're yeah, call 911 and we'll put a ticket on that one. Okay. Uh, it's not a 311 issue. By the time we get 311s through our system, they're not parked there anymore. So call immediately and we'll, we'll cite them once and uh, we'll cite them twice. So as many times as they do it. And they'll eventually call us and ask us why they can't park in their own driveway and we'll have to explain it and they'll understand. I did just that this afternoon. Okay. So I'll be standing by listening. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Commander. Okay, moving on, um, public safety, John Tokarski. You were with us. I'm just trying to unmute. There we okay. go. Okay, yay. Good day. Good day, everybody. Good to see everyone. Uh, Things aren't real busy right now on public safety outside of what you're reading <laughs> and hearing in the newspaper about a lot of a lot of the personnel in our bureaus being hit by COVID, and we're taking precautionary steps to make sure it's contained. Uh, within our outreach and education area, uh, we're more than halfway through our fall session of the Student Citizens Police Academy. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to send up right now to you, everybody my email address. Anyone who has an interest, we'll be, can, we'll be restarting these back up. We've been doing them uh, virtually and we'll be starting them back up in the spring. So just to remind you all, the Citizens Police Academy is a 15 week course. The Student Police Academy is for anybody that you know might be in high school or anybody who may be applying or looking at the university and, and interested in criminal justice. It's a 10 week program. And uh, basically puts them through the steps of what cadets go through at the Police Academy. So again, the Citizens Police Academy will be starting up again in February and the students in March. And uh, my email address is there. If anybody has an interest or would like a flyer when it's ready, an application form, I'd be more than happy to email it to you. Uh, let's see what else is going on. We've got uh, Stuff With Love. Uh, that's a traditional annual effort been put on by our Pittsburgh police where they deliver food, complete Thanksgiving dinners to people of need. Uh, there's no economic guidelines they have to meet. If they feel they need it, they're, especially in these tough times now, all they need to do is contact uh, up in zone four. I'm not exactly sure who's handling it right now. I don't know if, if Dave, if you're aware of it, uh, it was Vicki Butch. So she may be the one taking it, but give a call up there uh, with how many meals you need. And they'll be more than happy to deliver them to you on Thanksgiving day between 8 a.m. until they're done. Uh, other than that, that's pretty much been it. It's just been, uh, so, well, I guess one more thing. Tomorrow night, uh, we'll have the Zone 4 Public Safety Zone Council meeting. This will be quite interesting. Uh, zone 4 Public Safety Council was representative of communities throughout Zone 4 that the police serve, uh, including Oakland. Uh, you know, Liz, Liz is a regular uh, participant and also one of the leaders of the team for that. Tomorrow night, we'll be featuring the Reverend uh, Cornell Jones, he heads up the city's group violence intervention effort. And uh, there's been a lot of effort put into group intervention, into restorative justice practices, and basically addressing those people in the community who've been causing havoc over the years, who wanna get straight and wanna start off good in their life, that helping hand, that need that they have to, uh, to get themselves settled so they could be contributing members of society. Um, Reverend Jones is a tremendous speaker. He used to serve as a chaplain at the state uh, correctional facility over uh, in the north side and on Woods Run. So he'd be more than willing to talk to you in detail if you'd like to hear him. Uh, anybody's interested, just contact Liz and she'll give you, she'll get you hooked up with the, uh, the Zoom. With the Zoom link mm -hmm. for the meeting tomorrow, which starts at six o'clock. Any questions, issues, concerns? Nope. Yep. All right, guys, thanks so much. Have a wonderful, wonderful Thanksgiving. You too. Thank you. Thank you. Um, University of Pittsburgh Police, Officer Johnson. Hi, everyone. Uh, 
for our uh, stats for the month of October, um, we've had uh, a few incidents. We had uh, one aggravated assault arrest to non-affiliate off campus. Um, we had one criminal trespass um, off campus uh, arrest. And uh, we had two defiant trespass citations issued. We had one uh, drug violation arrest uh, non-affiliate on campus, and we had one DUI arrest, um, and we had three harassment reports. One uh, resulted in a citation. Uh, we had five open containers, citations issued to the ordinance. Uh, we had five panhandlers. panhandlers. Uh, one of those were uh, given a citation. Uh, four were given warnings. Um, and uh, I started putting down suspicious activity in persons. We had 30 of those incidents, 13 on campus, 17 off. None of uh, uh, important, I guess, or, or make a note of. Um, we had one warrant rest and our impact uh, gave 29 warnings to loud music uh, during impact and uh, we received responded with uh, 47 knock and talks during the month of October. Um, and uh, as far as conduct referrals were concerned, uh, we had 26 of those, uh, two for disordered conduct, uh, one for uh, drug violation, one for marijuana, one for open container, one for public urination, six for underage drinking, and 14 for university violation of university rules and regulations. Um, and um, that's basically all our stats. Um, we also had a police citi uh, citizens academy. Uh, that graduation is tonight. We ended up with uh, three students. Start out with four, we ended up with three. So that graduation is tonight. Um, and then as far as, you know, just making sure you understand when, when students are gone um, after Next week we'll still be here uh, doing our job, so we'll be we'll be uh, patrolling as, as as normal. Any questions for me? Okay, thanks, Dan. Thank you. And I noticed we also have Emily from the um, office at Nighttime Economy. Is there anything you want to report on? Uh, don't really have any updates. We're just uh, continuing to watch for changes in any restrictions as of right now. With the state restrictions that were just um, updated yesterday, mm -hmm. um, there is going to be some more stringent expectations on businesses. And I don't know if anyone saw um, the county health department uh, today but they you know the county is also promoting that you're know, wearing masks at all times inside of businesses unless you're you know eating so even if you're just sitting at the table and the expectation is you know very strong still on businesses so we just want to ask people you know if, if you know businesses that aren't following the rules you can report them to ACHD if they're a liquor licensed business you can also report them to um, liquor control enforcement those are the two agencies uh, in charge of enforcing. And, um, you know, we're just trying to help keep, keep everybody responsible so we don't have to shut down again. Any questions for Emily? Oh, Thank Emily, you. Uh, yep. yeah, actually, have you heard anything about the bar in the 200 block of, of Myron Avenue in Oakland? I have not, and I haven't seen any 311 complaints about it. What's going on? Oh, no, it's shut down. It's going up for share sale. Oh, wow. Yeah. Huh. Oh, so Myron, that used to be Pittsburgh Cafe? Yeah, I'm wondering where the license oh. is. Huh. Yeah. Um, I can... Did you look it up on the LCB license search no, website? No, I haven't had a chance. I'm sorry. But oh, that's okay. I'll look it up and um, I can email you with whatever I find. I just didn't know if you had like, you couldn't find info or anything, but I'll look it up and I can email you. Okay. That'd be great. Thank you. You're welcome. 
All right, moving on to um, city and county departments, Office of the Mayor, Eric Williams. There you are. Hey, good evening. Uh, so I have a few updates. I'll keep it super short, but I'm happy to share it. Past I already passed it along to Liz already about everything because I got freed up. But let me pull up my announcement for the mayor's budget. One second. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'll share all this information in the uh, chat to like right away because um, we're uh, in going towards end of the meeting. But the press release was put out about the mayor's budget. He put out his 2021 operating and capital budget and that there's going to be a $55 million deficit. And if we don't get federal aid by the July 1st, um, we may have to do some um, layoffs. Um, if you haven't seen it already, it's about 600 plus employees will have to lay off. But however, we still are going to push through with paving 65 uh, miles of, of roads in the city, as well as other essential services will still continue throughout um, way before, after uh, July 1st. But there is a number of different cuts that's happening. So I encourage you to definitely check out the mayor's operating and capital budgets. Um, they were able to work some magic like most cities that have already furloughed or laid off many employees um, were are not there yet. So we'll see what happens. Um, and then the last thing I'll mention is the our COVID a website from the city is still up and going. We post everything that's going on that as far as the city is concerned, as well as Allegheny County and other groups that we work with cooperatively, the governor's office as well, to keep folks updated as to what's going on about uh, COVID-19 and guidelines. So I'll leave it there. If you want me to speak to anything specifically, I'm happy to. Any questions, Liz? No, I don't. Question. Any anybody have a question for Eric? Eric's list is also posted on the meeting webpage for opdc.org for tonight's meeting. Thank you for that. Yeah. Okay. Nobody from PLI could join us tonight, and so Liz, you are the lucky one with property. Yes, let me bring up my page here. Okay. Uh, we've actually had some uh, success, some movement as of recently. Um, we were in, okay, I'm going to start with zero boundary. His permit has been approved. Uh, okay, this is where we have a wall that's in kind of serious need of some help. He finally got his permit approved. He asked for his court date to be delayed until January, which was allowed. But now he's also going to be in court in January for the fact that he hasn't closed off the vacant park, the vacant lot because it's turned into a huge parking lot for students. Okay, nothing on 2610 Forbes. Um, I was by there today and I do think somebody may have broken into it. I'm not sure, I'll have to go back and check. There is news also on 3202 Niagara Street. Okay. Um, they failed their third inspection with regard to over occupancy, and they are going to be going back to court. A court paper has been sent to the magistrate's office. Um, also, they had an inspection with regard to a couch on the porch and violation there. They have two more inspections on that, but I'm pretty sure they'll have it moved before then. 3204 Niagara Street and 33 Niagara Street are basically abandoned properties. We cannot locate the owners, but this last week saw the new clean and lean department from DPW was out and boy, did they clean. Um, you can actually see the front of these two houses, which you couldn't see for years. They went and they got everything out of the front of 3319, so students can now walk on the sidewalk, which is great. They cleared the front of 3204 Niagara Street, and it, it has made a difference, again, letting the sidewalk be opened up. Okay, can we roll down here, Nick? Scroll down, Nick. Okay. Um, 3221 Kennett Square was in housing court at the end of last month. And they were found guilty and they yay. were, yes, big yay. They were given a fine of $116,000. 
Um, they had 30 days to appeal or pay. As far as I can tell, they have not appealed at this point in time. Um, Nick, can you? <laughs> okay. Right. I'm going over here, Nick. Okay. Uh, okay. So I'll let you know when that comes Sorry, up. Sorry, I didn't have a second page. Oh. Oh, you, it came up on the screen. Don't worry about it. I've got mine. Okay. okay. Um, 3401 and to 3421 Bates Street. That was where that fire incident was at. Um, so that's still ongoing, the investigation. It has been boarded up. It took them some time to do it, but they did do it in the end. But in the meantime, I filed more tickets on the weed and debris. Um, just a great collection of vodka bottles going there. Uh, there's no update with regard to 3421 Parkview Avenue. The owner passed away recently at the end of October. So we're just going to, the court date was canceled. So that's kind of in flux right now. 3611 Fraser Street, which is over in South Oakland. Um, they're getting in touch with the relatives that have posted the place for sale. The owners are actually deceased. So hopefully we'll get something back on that. Also, a new ticket has been filed with regard to the car that's been left abandoned there. One Air Street, uh, the last court date was November the 9th. The owner of the property did not show up, but at this time it has been given, taken back by the bank and PLI and I are working with the people that are gonna be working on the property to get it at least to the point where it isn't a danger to people. It'll be boarded up and some of the exterior work is going to be done. So um, that's about it. If anybody has any other properties in Oakland, if you can shoot me a text, um, there's been a lot of changes going on. A lot of sales I've noticed have come up recently. So again, we have a lot of vacant properties. So if we can all just keep an eye on them to make sure, you know, Weather's getting cold and just don't want any break-ins and everything. And also back to the students going away, please, again, keep an eye on your neighborhood students' places. It'll just be better for all of us. Anybody have any questions? Okay, thanks. Sure. And Gwen, we did not forget you from the um, parking authority. I don't have access to the information that I sent you. Liz, Liz do you have that? Yeah, no. Can you post it? Okay, I'm gonna post it for my screen, guys. Okay, sorry. Please stand by. Okay. <laughs> I still wanted to come up with this. Oh, there we go. Kind of, sort of. <laughs> All right, what's going on? Okay, you should be able to see everything now. Can you, you see it? Read it anyway? I don't think you need to read it. Just basically, if you can tell us what's going on. I know you, like everybody else in the city, has been hit by staffing issues. Oh, my goodness. We have um, 12 full-timers that are working out of our, normally we've got, we're, we're budgeted for like 25 uh, full-time employees. We didn't bring our part-time employees back, but we did bring back all our full-timers. Out of those 25, I've got 12 that are actively working, but we're trying to fill two shifts, a Monday through Friday and a Tuesday through Saturday. Um, and only during the daytime hours so from 8 a.m until 6 p.m are they enforcing um and with the call-ins i generally have about eight officers working per day they are doing a great job trying to cover the city but it's it's just really not enough when how do you have uh like for the first part there, the daytime enforcement for Q and S, you have 30 tickets, but no plate reads. Is that handwritten or? So <clears throat> the, the plate reads are only going to show up <clears throat> 
with the um, the RPP with the uh, license plate recognition vehicles. The officers also have the ability to run that same information through their uh, their handhelds. So if they're running it directly through their handhelds, it's not going to show up under plate reads. Okay. Wow. Hey, Gwen, I've got a question. We have a, a problem at the corner of Kraft and Niagara Street in, in Oak Cliff. Mm -hmm. There's no parking signs there. And I've asked Domi to repaint the big yellow curb. The people have been parking along there, which apparently there was a problem recently when a fire engine wanted to get around the corner and couldn't because of the way the cars were parked. Can your guys ticket those guys too? I can't do anything without signage. <clears throat> no, no. No parking signs there. She meant there are no parking. Signs that say no signs parking. Signs that say no parking. Yes, yeah. you can enforce yeah. that. Okay, good. If they yeah. could keep an eye on that. We yeah. And just for the rest of us, we come up Kennett, and you cannot see around the corner to turn on to Craft Avenue. And they tend to be SUVs. Like, you, you literally... Like can't see. They park right, right up to the corner. Corner parking is a yeah. Trend. So anything that is a no parking violation, we definitely want to get those. So Great. don't hesitate to call in because I'll get someone out there immediately. Can they do that as they're going through just on their their route? They do, and they they're instructed to. So. No parkers are generally the priority. Um, now, RPP uh, residential areas are the next in priority. And hate to say it to the world, but the meters are the lowest in priority. Because um, we, fi we figure generally most people are going to pay the meter if they're parking at a meter. But we're trying to enforce all the above. Excellent. Thank you, Gwen. Okay, any other questions for Gwen? All right, thank you. Um, I think we struck out on city council unless somebody um, from district three, six or eight, if anybody is, is with us, would you please unmute and let us know? All right, um, moving on to university partners, um, Jamie and or Alex. Thanks, Elena. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I think that uh, Paul and Dean Bonner did an excellent job in providing a high level overview and a lot of uh, actual details as well. So I won't uh, say too much and overload with Pitt, just a few things. We continue to encourage uh, community members and residents and um, even our Pitt community to utilize our COVID concern uh, reporting tool. I'll drop the link in the uh, chat and there's also a, a phone number that residents can call to if they have any community related concerns about um, COVID and perhaps the behavior of students or Pitt staff and faculty or just general things happening in the community. That is reviewed and monitored um, by the compliance committee that uh, Dean Bonner mentioned. So. We, uh, we keep track of all those complaints and act on them if necessary when they come through. Um, myself and Ryan, who's uh, I know on the call tonight from SGB, um, put together a small uh, tenant workshop video. So if you'll remember, this is about the time of year when we uh, and many uh, partners on the call, I see Liz uh, giggling a little bit, um, host uh, student tenant workshops to inform them of their uh, rights and responsibilities as tenants, but also to provide a lot of really useful information about what it means to be a member uh, of community um, when you're living off campus, whether it's in Oakland or some other, other part of the city. So obviously because of the pandemic, we weren't able to do that in person and uh, put together a small video, some resources, you'll be seeing that pretty soon. Uh, and potentially we'll look to some other avenues of communication in the spring to revisit that. Uh, OPDC has been doing a great job with uh, Adopt-A-Blocks and, and working with some of our student groups. Uh, there was supposed to be one last Saturday, but unfortunately due to the stay at home uh, or uh, shelter in place, excuse me, um, guidelines that the university issued, we had to 
uh, advise our students not to participate. So that didn't take place, but we're looking forward to continuing to, to partner uh, in the spring as conditions allow to make sure those uh, go on and have a positive impact uh, in Oakland. And the last thing I'll say is just, just confirming some dates. So this Friday is the last day of fall classes. Um, December 5th is the final day of the term. On December 6th, that's when the student recess begins uh, and residence halls close for the most part. There might be some exceptions, um, but the majority of students, as Dean Bonner mentioned, will be uh, leaving um, campus. Uh, the staff and faculty winter recess will begin on Monday the 21st, and then the university will reopen on January 4th. Uh, the first day of spring term is actually Tuesday the 19th. And we'll have another compressed uh, term next spring. So the, there's no spring recess and the term will end on May 1st. And uh, actually one more thing to add, uh, both uh, Paul and Dean Bonner mentioned the off-campus safety ambassadors. Uh, they've done a fantastic job working throughout all areas uh, of Oakland to promote positive behavior and just be um, really some great ambassadors, I think, for the university um, throughout the community. So they're going to be working rounds through next uh, Tuesday, the 24th. And to your point, Liz, about students leaving for holiday or just being away, I'll make sure I talk to them about adding that to some of the, the uh, updates they provide students when they encounter them on the streets. So just another way to get that out. But you might see them uh, through this weekend and uh, early next week. That'd be great. Thank you. Jamie, do you have anything to add? No, I appreciate Alex's update. And uh, you can always contact us if you have any follow-up questions as well. Thank you. Any questions for either of them? All right, Student okay. Government Board, Ryan, wait, a question? I'm sorry. Do you guys have an update yet on the pit Christmas food thing? Yeah, so uh, great question. So Christmas Day at Pitt, uh, we actually, uh, so based on the stay at home advisory, uh, we are increasingly feeling like we may need to cancel the event. Uh, we had uh, kind of downscaled as, as much as we could, uh, but just thinking about the health and safety of our pit dining and uh, food services staff, as well as the volunteers on site, um, there's just going to be, you know, it's, it's, uh, tough to, to bring a large group of folks to campus. And we are, we're anticipating need of up to about 3,500 meals. So that's a lot of people. Um, so right now I, I am thinking that we may have to cancel, but uh, we'll make that official decision after uh, consulting with senior leadership on Monday. Okay, yeah, if you can keep me posted, that'd be great. Thank you. Will do. Ryan, Student Government Board. Yeah, thank you. Uh, hi, guys. Um, I just have a couple of things that I wanted to talk about um, before the conclusion of this meeting. So like Alex said, um, the Community and Governmental Relations Committee within SGB has been working um, with his office to put together a video containing information on off-campus housing and safety. So make sure to keep a lookout for that. Um, and then secondly, uh, SGB is continuing to work with the university administration to combat the spread of coronavirus, both on and off campus. Um, like as I mentioned before, um, President Eric McAdangdang and other members of SGB have participated in neighborhood walks to ensure students um, are taking necessary precautions against the virus and practicing social distancing. That's something that Dean Bonner talked about in his updates as well. Um, and then secondly, um, the Community and Governmental Relations Committee has also distributed posters to local Oakland businesses and establishments in the community that promote positive behaviors and mask wearing and social distancing. Um, so that's kind of what we've been doing, um, and now we're kind of shifting our focus um, to the spring semester and how we can help out there. Um, but yeah, that's all I have for you guys tonight. Thank you. Any questions for Ryan? All right, moving on to community, general community questions and answers. Any questions? Liz, I know you have an announcement. Yes, I do. Um, Next Tuesday, which I believe is the 24th at 6 p.m., there is an Oakland-wide meeting and Carlo University will be presenting their Carlo Master Plan before they take it to the Planning Commission. This will include the St. Agnes demo and other development proposals. 
Okay, it'll be a Zoom. The information will be on the o OPDC calendar. Or if you have any questions, you can just give me a call or email me, lgray at opdc.org. That's it. All right, thank you. All right, thank you everybody for joining us. Um, there is no Oak Watch meeting in December, January 20th at 6 p.m. will be our next meeting. It is anticipated to also be by Zoom. And happy Thanksgiving. Yes, everybody. Good holidays, everyone. Stay safe. Stay safe. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.